Thank you so much for making the arduous trek through the snow uh, to be with us at Hatfield College this evening. This is the fourth lecture in the Aftermath lecture series, which has been running since October of the this term. Uh, this is the fourth lecture and we've got three to go and the lectures so far have been absolutely brilliant and we've had amazing audiences, so thank you very much for your support if you've if you joined us before. The lecture this evening will be another great addition to the series and the Master of Hatfield College, Tim Burt, is going to introduce the first day. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a very great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce my uh, good friend Douglas Davies to give tonight's lecture. Um, I'm sure Douglas needs no introduction to most of you. He is a professor in the Department of Theology and Religion. He is a fellow of Hatfield College and a very loyal member of the Senior Common Room. And um, he is a person who ranges, I think, across the fields of theology and anthropology and rightly has an international reputation on those scores. I think tonight he's going to talk to us um, specifically about the aftermath of Princess Diana's death, but I'm sure he's going to range more widely than that particular event. But anyway, Douglas, you are very welcome in what we can describe as your own college, and thank you for giving us a lecture this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Master, very much for that, and it's great to be here, and great to see so many of you who've uh, tracked and are there. That is, if anyone has particularly weary knees, there is one potential seat in the window, which is the coziest place in Hatfield, I'm sure about that. Thinking about this issue of aftermath, to me, was interesting, for a variety of reasons that will emerge as I take us through the evening. I want to take us through a variety of scenes. I'm setting scenes, really. We're going to hear a, about three or so scenes, three or four stories of a deeply human uh, elements. I do this, of course, and I'm sure with many of you too, uh, r in reminding ourselves that this week is the 70th anniversary, if that is the right word, for the relief, if that is the right word, of Auschwitz. What verbs do we use in certain human circumstances? Verbs are a challenge to our humanity, essentially, and uh, situations of event and indeed of aftermath. And that I want to flag up as the idea at the back of our mind as we approach a variety of, of points. Yes, indeed, I will say something about Diana Princess of Wales and her death and her funeral and certain consequences of that. She died in 1997, 18 years ago. So you'd need to be about 28 or something to have it in your mind at all. And not everybody in the room this evening is 28. So that's important for those who do have um, a, as it were, a living memory. <coughs> the day when Diana died. I woke up extremely early. I was teaching at Nottingham University and I had an engagement in Canterbury that very day. So I woke up in the middle of the night and put the radio on and couldn't quite work out what on earth they were saying. And then I worked out what they were saying. It was a Sunday. I thought, this is amazing, I thought. And um, I was going to an eight o'clock uh, Holy Communion service at the church nearby before I set off to Canterbury. It's always important to do proper prayers before you go to Canterbury, because you never know what might happen when you get there. And the priest didn't know what to say in that part of the Eucharist when you pray for the dead. Was she dead? Was the news accurate? Now that's very interesting. In the, in the modern media world, are reports true? Because in a sense, you need reports to be true before you ask the Almighty something for someone. So a very interesting, immediate aftermath, a liturgical problem. And that would have been repeated, I guess, in thousands of churches across Britain that day. And then in driving down to Canterbury, I had the car radio on the whole, work, the whole day, the whole way down, long journey actually. And this really interesting, now if any of you is called John, I apologise before I say this, the bright Johnnies of the BBC. Lots of our students go to the BBC and I do quite a lot of work with them. They're great guys. And some of you will go into the media as well. They're all very bright and they do great things. 
but sometimes they feel they're omniscient. And then they're caught out and they, they realise they're stuck. And that was a day when the British media was stuck. They didn't know quite what to say, they didn't have a script, they didn't have a cultural script, and I'll come back to that later in a very important way. They didn't possess a cultural, and that's rather strange in Britain just now, because the BBC is an extraordinarily competent organisation, generally speaking. So there was a provisionality, the aftermath, provisionality in the media, because the media play an extraordinarily significant part in what I want to talk about tonight. And I'm going to take this from country to country and from human situation to human situation as we go through. But that was an immediate kind of aftermath. And the media had to put things on rapidly that they, they weren't scheduling, they had to get people together. They had to do stuff. Improvisation after aftermath. Media improvisation. A very interesting uh, element going on there. Then I'm going to take us after that and now I've got an interesting problem. What do you call somebody? What do you call somebody? When is a name a problem? When is an aftermath name a problem? Aftermath nominalism, we can create. You know, they pay as a professor to use nice words sometimes, because if you just speak directly, they think they're not getting value for money, or something like that. <laughs> Anders Breivik, Oslo, just three or so years ago. We'll come back to him and why that name is a difficult name to use in cultural context. He is in your living memory, because none of you was deaf in that sense culturally three years ago. And then finally, I want to take us back to my part of Wales, to a, the town called Aberfan, where there was a mining disaster in 1966. That was 49 years ago. So you need to be about 60 or thereabouts. Aha, I am, which is great. Uh, older, actually, which is lovely. Uh, to remember that. But for many of you, that will be a cultural absence, probably. A name, but nothing else. And that's quite significant. One theme, as far as Diana and Abavan are concerned, over that large period of time, is Her Majesty the Queen. She was an actor, an agent, a cultural agent in both. This is one of the most remarkable human beings in Britain in terms of cultural experience, knowledge of people, knowledge of circumstances, knowledge of situations. So when, as it were, that the aftermath of Diana emerged, and so much has been made of it in the film of the Queen and goodness knows here, there and everywhere. Of whom were they speaking? Of whom were the bright Johnnies of the BBC pinning down, getting sorted? Well, somebody much wiser than them for a starter. And so on and so forth. But I'm not here to give a monarchist address tonight. That will suffice for the moment, as it were. What I want to do, I've roughly outlined, and I'm going to outline a little more depth, the cases, and then I want to raise a series of concepts, which is the toolkit for analysing the cases. So I roughly said something about the cases, say a little bit more about those, then I'm going to do some concepts, then I want to use those as tools for coming back on the cases that we will, we will have uh, covered. Now, the case of Diana, of course, is well known to us. No one known in as much as she was celebrity. And my key point here is that this was a moment in British cultural history when celebrity and establishment collided. I've got a new book which will be out with a bit of luck before the year is out, but a bit slow at the moment. And in it, I really go to town on the concept of the establishment in terms of the sociology of religion in Britain. Because most sociologists have missed, in my humble opinion, the concept of establishment, the establishment, who make up the establishment, how do the establishment influence things that go on in Britain. Many of you guys, you know about the establishment. You, your parents, you're, you're part of the establishment. We are part of the establishment in some sense. How does the establishment, as it were, filter, throw light on such things as 
disasters. And in a sense, Diana was one a very interesting moment when uh, celebrity wasn't there in Winston Churchill's funeral. No, not celebrity. Great man is not celebrity. Great man is not celebrity, nor great woman for that matter. But in this case, the era of celebrity had emerged and the culture of celebrity and with the establishment. When you get a well-known pop singer playing a piano in Westminster Abbey and singing a song, you know something has happened. When you've got a great choir and a pop artist in Westminster Abbey, you know celebrity and establishment have merged or brush shoulders or something. A task for us. There she was, famous, beautiful. Did she have food problems? She was an aristocrat anyway, but she was having trouble with the royal family. Were they treating her uh, fairly? Her sons were princes. Family discord. Every family in the country knows about family discord. An element of affinity with her. There it was. Divorce. Many families in the country divorce. Empathy. A kind of a, an embodiment of those kind of issues. There she had her, her alternative love with Jodi al Fayed, a Muslim whose father is running Harrods. Wow, you couldn't write this stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Even a professor of English couldn't write this stuff. Couldn't write it. This is amazing, what was going on. She'd been dealing with AIDS. She'd been dealing with landmines. Here was a, a, an individual who, as it were, had aligned herself with areas of suffering. Those kind of ongoing catastrophes which have their own little aftermaths. So there's a sense in which what is happening with Diana is accumulation of many human traumas and crises, magnified, intensified is a word I love, the intensification of lots of these things coming together. We'll come back to that. Had she been betrayed by the royal family? Betrayal. I spent the last 10 years or more now working quite a lot on emotions and the role of emotions, the nature of emotions in groups. And this also is lying, as it were, behind the things I'm saying here, since betrayal was one of the great emotions, cultural emotions. But then if we take ourselves right over there to Norway and we're thinking of this guy who has cultural problems with Muslims, with colored people of all shapes and sizes, if they weren't his image of what a good Nordic should be. Back there in July 2011, he massacres over 60 young people, a dozen or so adults, he dresses as a guardian of the law in order to destroy <coughs> the law. So a radical betrayal of cultural identity in himself as an embodiment, as it were, of evil. And that on an island that was itself symbolic of youthful political hopes, ambitions, and life of vitality. He took mortality to a place of rampant vitality in what is a democracy. So here we are dealing with the fundamental elements of society, if you like, manifest and engaged. And that's really important for my lecture because in, in the volume that one of Liz's paintings hangs on the front cover of the Emotion and Identity book, one of the key issues in that book is how when an emotion comes to an, an idea, you get a value. It's the Davis formula. Idea plus emotion equals value. When that value is about identity, it becomes belief. And when it's about destiny and identity, it's a religious belief. It's a kind of a formula. And these are concepts to play with. And when you see them going in reverse, other things begin to happen. Here we have a radical cultural betrayer. He was <coughs> betraying, and we'll see more of which, more of that in a moment. 
take ourselves back then to before most of you were born, back to 1966. And we have this small mining village and all of a sudden big coal tips decide to roll down the hill like uh, an avalanche hitting the local school and killing all these folks, 144 dead, little children and, uh, and parents and teachers. The very interesting, I've got an analysis of this coming out in a, in a thing that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, a bit later, but extraordinarily interesting, industrial uh, catastrophe, industrial trauma in an industrial part of the world. And in the book that will come out, if and when you read it, there's an analysis of industrial betrayal. Because there was, an, there was a, 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 a committee set up to analyse what had gone wrong. Had the National Coal Board, had those responsible for it, not done what they ought to have done. And a big discussion of these things, and, and very fascinating it is. So there are scenes, there are scenes, and we'll have a, a look at them visually um, in, in about ten minutes before I go on with later analysis. But before I do that, I want to talk about a few concepts. Concepts are really quite interesting. I suppose it's why we like being in universities. And if we don't, I suppose we all pack up and go home. And one of the most interesting things, in a sense, about being a, a researcher is having a mind, and by now, researchers are two sorts of minds. You have the very detailed, nitpicking kind of scholar. In universities, absolutely need them, and I'm not one of those. Or you have uh, minds that wander, butterfly minds that go all over the place. You know, there's the homing pigeon who always comes back to his one box kind of thing. He knows where he's coming from. It's like the um, the hedgehog and the um, you know <coughs> hedgehog and the fox. Uh, Marvel story. But ideas are quite interesting because as your mind searches, works from things you know, those little synapses link up with things you don't know, and then an idea is born. And a couple of these points I want to talk about are those sort of ideas. One of them is what I call um, the, the, the moral somatic relationship. Not the psychosomatic, but the way our minds, whatever they are, and our bodies, whatever it is, link together. Not the psychosomatic, the moral somatic. And for those of you who are in social sciences, by moral I mean society. I don't mean being an awfully nice boy and girl. I don't mean that at all. That's not morality. That's something different. But being a social animal. But the moral somatic, how you, you as a body, as, a, as an entity, as, as a, a body, as a somatic thing, feel and link with the society around you. Now you all know the experience, because you've all had it, about something making you sick. You hear of something and you say, that makes me sick. Not just as a conventional phrase, but as a real existential experience. It makes me sick. When you have that feeling, it makes you sick. That's, you're in the moral somatic world. Your body is responding to something that's happened in society and it makes you sick. And this moral somatic relationship is very important for our, ever, for our evolutionary development. And for the development of, of collaborative societies, for cooperation and for rules and all that sort of stuff. And as we obey them, live in them, we're not sick. But things do make us sick sometimes. The moral somatic relationship. And it takes you, it can go negative, as when we had a doctor who started killing lots and lots of his old people. It makes you sick when you hear about that. Or when some guys kill some poor boy and they're never brought to justice. And yet they're probably known as to who they are. It makes you sick. And it does because we are social, moral animals. It will make us sick. And we need that kind of sickness because we need the opposite of it. We need the health. Moral somatic health comes when great things happen. And we think, oh, that's really good. That's great. That's society working. That's people working. And the whole, this whole problem about priests doing nasty things to people they should have pastoral responsibility for that sort of positive moral somatic relationships then turn sour and you get the net, it makes me sick. Are you with me? Do you see what I mean? Moral somatic relationships, quite important. Can give us positive or negative uh, sensations. 
the other theory, and it's very related now to this, is one that uh, I developed, I can't remember when it was, because I didn't look it up this afternoon, but there, there was a book uh, published, it was a handbook on sociology of religion produced by Blackwell, so at about 10, 12 years ago, I can't remember now, in which I was asked to write a uh, sociology of disasters. And in that book, this was before all this stuff actually, in the, in the sociology of disasters, for the sake of argument, I developed what I call, what I call the theory of offending death. The theory of offending death. That, that some people die, and look, when you're old and 80 and 90 and you die, that's great. So, you know, when your granny and grandfather dies, be thankful, they've reached that age. It's not a catastrophe, it's natural. We get sad and upset, but it's natural, it's not a problem. And if everybody here today went out with the idea in their head that death of the old is not a problem, I'd be a happy man and it would have been worth, would have been worth coming for that alone, and that for us as well when our turn, time comes. But there are some deaths that are not like that. There are deaths that when it happens, it makes us sick. It makes us sick. You hear of some poor child that's been killed in some horrid way, and it's happening, we're lucky we live in safe, so some of my students get bored sick of me telling we live in safe society and we should be grateful for it. When just now all over the world there's awful, awful things happening. The theory of offending death, and what the theory of offending death argued was that you get a mass popular response, crowds form, big crowds form, when a death or deaths occur that make them sick. In other words, when society is offended by what's happened. And in that chapter, I went through a whole series of these. Because once you get an idea, you can then use it as a tool to classify many things which otherwise are unintelligible in relation to each other, you might say. So that... Your brains need a little moment, you see, just to, to settle themselves, which is always a good thing. Ah, yes, there we are, I found it, here we are. So that, for example, if you took yourself back to 1998, to Colombia and to Bogota, there was a great march there. It followed days after the massacre of 25 young men, between 16 and 23 years of age. There was a mass popular response. I can't read all the details now, but it was an interesting example. Or we could take ourselves to, uh, to Ireland, to Omar, for example. August 22nd, 1998. It's all it's very interesting date-wise to their circle. They're surrounding the, the Diana thing, which is quite interesting in a way. Bomb explosion. Some 60,000 people were reckoned to have gathered on that event, on that occasion. Mass popular response, anger, if you like. Or go to Belgium. Do we have anybody here from Belgium? Well, not because I can make the standard British joke about Belgium, which is, you know, what do we know about it? Well, one thing we probably don't know about it that we should is that in September 1996, there was what was called the White March. Vast numbers of people came out and marched carrying white stuff. It was reckoned between 200 and 300,000 people came together. Those who stayed at home hung white sheets out from their windows. Why were those going on? Well, there was a guy called Mark Dutroux, who had been involved in paedophilia, which involved the death, the imprisonment and death of some poor kids in cellars. And so it was awful. And it was believed that perhaps people in positions of political authority had been involved. Things going on in Britain, just like it at the moment, so keep your ears skinned, eyes skinned, ears open. <laughs> uh, there they were. They were protesting. It made them sick that this sort of thing had happened. These were offensive deaths. Now, part of the offensive death theory is that it is thought that people in positions of social authority are to blame. That people in positions of social authority are to blame. Because we are here at the heart of the idea of society, of social force, of social power, of social responsibility. 
what was going on in Diana's case. Maybe we'll come back to that in a minute. So lots of these. Or we could go to Bob Geldof and we could go to that great event of the Live Aid of 1984. Lots of events when vast numbers of people have come out to stand up for something. And they're standing up, as it were, for, for what is right in society, for what should not make one sick, but what, for, what, but what should actually cause blessing. Because the opposite of, if you like, what I call identity depletion, is what happens in these situations, is identity fulfillment, shared identity fulfillment, not just me, my fulfillment, but our fulfillment. So that sort of idea, and then the theory of offending death, along with those, that moral somatic thing, is quite important. Now, now I want to add a third idea to it. <clears throat> those two are sort of my arranged ideas. This one isn't. And I won't read the history of it, because it's slightly complex. But um, I would take us straight to the Oxford anthropologist Rodney Needham, who was a very interesting guy, <clears throat> very influential in my own thinking, very awkward Englishman. You know, if, you, if you've been an officer with the Gurkhas and done all sorts of stuff like that, and you're the right sort of person, then there are difficulties. We got on very well. Uh, that's another story altogether. But uh, in his work, one of the things that Needham comes out with is what he calls, what he used as, the idea of, of dual sovereignty. Dual sovereignty. Now, this idea of dual sovereignty for him meant a balance between justice, law, the police, the dual aspects of life, on the one hand, and what he called, and this is potentially a difficult kind of concept, and what he called the mystical world on the other, by which he meant things that cause you to flourish things that are blessings. And his sort of argument, there was a guy who argued this before him, my God, this and the new volume is coming out. Um, and when these things are balanced, when, the, when the, the dual and the mystic are balanced, a society works or a group works. If they were radically out of balance, trouble will ensue. If the law becomes a police state and everything that makes a blessing and sucker in life is downplayed, you've got trouble. So on and so forth. So these are three ideas which seem to me quite interesting to play with. And I'm asking a lot of you tonight to keep these three concepts in your head. I know that. These are three sorts of ideas which become players in the game of event, catastrophe, aftermath. So what I think we'll do now is we'll watch a short, um, a short piece that's been put together by Giorgio, my dear research student there. And whilst at this point I could explain why I want you to look at it, I'm not going to do that. We can just look at it and then, as it were, later on we can come back and we can see why perhaps it, it might have been worth, worth looking at it. I hope I've got the right one here now. Is it? George, is it this one? Same shot. So, oh, up there, all, all, all. Yeah? Excellent. Is it going to play now? I hope so. Lights, if anybody's new. Yeah, full, full screen and lights, if there's lights. Sitting around, just knock them off for a minute. Is that in the sun? Can you take a part of the white in the bottom line? Sound is difficult, so use your eyes. Notice the culture of muffled bells.
even the policeman clapping then. First time in British culture history. Thank you. 